Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on federal carbon pricing and the Supreme Court's decision last week. We're looking at the aftermath of that decision today. What is its impact on federal provincial powers, on federalism, on politics? And um, it was long awaited, as you know, and many of the provinces uh, across the country wanted to know whether or not the Supreme Court would rule that the GGPPA, the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, was in fact constitutional, meaning does the Canadian Constitution allow the federal government to impose a law that actually imposes carbon pricing on the provinces? And um, what does that mean at the end of the day for the provinces going forward? So I'm Pat Parody, the Executive Director of the Centre for Constitutional Studies in the Faculty of Law, and I will be moderating today's uh, webinar. I'm speaking to you today from Edmonton, which is on Treaty 6 territory, and the Centre acknowledges and honours the ancestors, their traditions, the spirit that first drew Indigenous people, the uh, Cree, the Blackfoot, the uh, Métis, the Nakota Sioux, the Soto, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and then settlers to this place, which has for thousands of years been a place of trade, uh, ceremony, and celebration. And we call on the intent of treaty to maintain us all in a strong and lasting relationship. Now, before I introduce our panelists, I would like to note that the webinar will go for one hour and 30 minutes. Each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes, and uh, then I will ask them each a question, and uh, they will respond fairly succinctly so that we can then move on to your questions. You will see the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and that's the one to use if you have a question you would like to ask. Uh, now, you will be able to see each other's questions, but we just want to let you know in advance that we probably won't get to all of them. We'll get to as many as we can, and we are going to compile some of the questions so that we can answer as many as possible. You'll be receiving a short feedback form after the webinar is over, and we really appreciate your feedback. So if you would take a few minutes to fill it out, we'd, we'd be very grateful. And lastly, please do note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website in uh, an, just a few days. You will be receiving notification if you've signed up for this webinar, which you obviously have if you're here, and uh, uh, to let you know that, that the webinar is in fact, uh, the, the recording rather is available. All right, now to begin, I will uh, say a little bit about each of our presenters. We have five presenters today. We're so very fortunate to have them here, but I'm going to keep my introductions short. I've asked the panelists if that's okay, and I have their blessings in that regard. So we will begin with Andrew Leach, who is an energy and environmental economist and is associate professor at the Alberta School of Business in the at the University of Alberta. He has a PhD in economics, a BSc in environmental sciences, and an LLM from the University of Alberta's Faculty of Law, which he managed to do during a sabbatical year, which was quite an interesting. His research focuses on constitutional law, energy and environmental economics, and he's particularly interested in climate change policies. Next will be Eric Adams, who is Vice Dean and a Professor of Law at the University of Alberta's Faculty of Law, where he teaches and publishes on constitutional law, legal history, employment law, human rights, and legal education. He's the lead legal historian uh, on the Shirk-funded partnership grant Landscapes of Injustice, which investigates the exile of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. And uh, Professor Adams is a research fellow with uh, the Centre for Constitutional Studies. Next, Noura Karazivan is an Associate Professor of Public Law in the Faculty of Law at the University of Montreal. Her research expertise includes Canadian federalism, constitutional structure, and the Charter. She also co-editor-in-chief of the Review of Constitutional Studies, which is one of our Centre's uh, journals. She is also the Canada Correspondent for the British Journal Public Law. Darcy Lindbergh will follow. He is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta's Faculty of Law, and he teaches constitutional law and Indigenous people and Indigenous law. He recently completed his PhD at the University of Victoria, and his doctoral work focused on the constitutional and legal theory of Plains Cree people in relation to land, water, 
and um, animals and the trans-systemic relationships with Canadian constitutional law. Last but not least, we will hear from Jocelyn Stacy, who is an assistant professor in the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia, where she researches the ways in which law creates, regulates, and prevents environmental crises. She is president of the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, a nonprofit society dedicated to training law students and young lawyers in public interest environmental law litigation. So with that brief introduction of our speakers, our illustrious panel, I will ask Andrew Leach to begin. Thanks very much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be back at a Center for Constitutional Studies event. So my role I think here is to, is to set the table to give you some sense of what the legislation is, what the ruling does and what it, uh, what it means and then turn over to the uh, real experts. I guess my intro to list me as an LLM student, although I'm finished but not graduated. So to think about the broader policy question, I, you know, I'm an economist. I like graphs. I'm going to put up graphs and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, I think when you look at Canada and you think of the context in which this legislation is operating, it's important to think about what we're dealing with. We're dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. And in particular, we're dealing with a situation where uh, Canada is not in a position to meet its international commitments and where meeting those international commitments is going to require action, either coordinated action on the part of at least uh, a set of the provinces or some type of oversight from the federal government. And without that ability for the federal government to, uh, I guess, coordinate policies at, you know, at worst, we won't meet our targets and we'll have uncoordinated provincial policies. But even if we do end up with coordinated provincial policies to meet our targets, we may face some significant economic costs from uh, a lack of that policy coordination. So those were the two main pieces of, of the puzzle that the federal government advanced when they talked about a need for pan-Canadian or for federal greenhouse gas legislation was this um, was this need to coordinate and, and to make sure the provinces had sufficiently stringent policies in place uh, to meet our targets. And of course, we've got to frame that with some discussion of targets and, and Canada, I've, I've said this at, at um, meetings here before, Canada is really good at going to international meetings and committing to targets. We're not very good at putting in uh, policies that allow us to meet them. So we are bending our curve down but even with all of the policies introduced through to the, the beginning of 2019, uh, or sorry, the beginning of 2020, we're still not on pace to meet even our 2030 target, let alone our really aggressive 2050 net zero goal. And so this isn't the end, this is the beginning. We uh, are still in a position where we're going to need more stringent federal policies. We saw the federal government announce their intention to increase the stringency of carbon pricing. We've also seen other policies come forward, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit now. Uh, so why is this, for those who aren't immersed in this, why is this an interesting federalism question? I give you another graph. And I think this gives you the sense of it when we look at the makeup first across provinces, and here I'm talking in emissions per capita, that we really see uh, the emphasis of Two, two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, but also the differences to the Atlantic regions and the territories. The different regions of our country are far more emissions intensive, so they're going to have very different consequences or very different um, realities when we talk about policies to reduce emissions. So these are just gonna hit harder in Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Atlantic provinces and the territories than they're gonna hit, for example, in Quebec, and that's hard to get away from. And we can slice this a different way and slice it across sectors. And this is where anybody that's taken 1L constitutional law will start to, to realize why this is a challenging problem for the federal government. That when we divide up our emissions into sectors, each of those headings at the top are things which fall squarely into provincial jurisdiction. The federal government isn't going to have a lot of ability to regulate in relation to buildings, to electricity, 92A, to industrial facilities, 9210, oil and gas, 92A, 9210, as, as much as you like. And then of course, even transportation, we have some federal laws uh, in terms of emissions and efficiency standards, 
but the reach into the transportation sector is really difficult. So the federalism challenge is, is right there. So the question that was before the Trudeau government and then before the court was what can parliament do to bend these curves? And these are projections to 2030. Right now, without new policies, we're not going to see us uh, meet our targets. So what was the federal toolkit that Prime Minister Trudeau put on the table? Uh, it was this Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. And I think what it does is pretty important. It has essentially two operational parts and then the rest are, are enforcement. Uh, the first part is effectively a carbon fuel charge. We better not call it a carbon tax uh, on that's imposed in provinces that are listed in the schedule of the act. And it's basically calculated on the implied emissions from fuels. And at the point of sale, this is charged to consumers of those fuels. And then part two essentially carves out large emitters and says, we're gonna create a separate carbon pricing regime for these emissions intensive and trade exposed industries. And for them, they'll still pay a carbon price, but they'll receive essentially tax credits or regulatory charge credits in return for output. So the more output they produce, the more emissions credits they receive to sort of um, buffer them against the competitiveness impacts of carbon pricing. So importantly, what's not there, there's no invalidation, overriding, or any direct interference with provincial legislation. It's, to use the, the Chief Justice's words, it's selective delegation to the provinces, but it's a federal regulatory charge. And it doesn't delve into performance standards or regulation at that firm level. So again, if your 1L constitutional flags were going off about regulating back into production, that's not the case with the GGPPA. So in the last couple of seconds, I'm just going to give you my quick thoughts uh, on, on the decision, what it found. Uh, Pat, you can give me a, a heads up of, of how my time is doing uh, would be helpful on the chat, maybe. Um, so what did, the, what did the Supreme Court find? Uh, the majority opinion, uh, Wagner plus five, it's held that establishing minimum national standards of greenhouse gas uh, price stringency to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, boy, that's a mouthful, is within Parliament's uh, powers under POC. And I think there were four bits of this decision that are really interesting and likely to be influential. Uh, the first one, not surprising that I'm focused on this, as it was the topic of a paper that I wrote with, uh, with Eric Adams, who you hear from in a minute, uh, that while POG is exclusively federal, jurisdiction under POG is not plenary and exclusive in the sense that, that some argued that it was, and that the double aspect doctrine applies. And that was what we argued, and, and the court cited us in that regard, which was, which was really nice to, to see. Um, I think the other thing which, which is important and, and probably the most important part of this decision is that there are many aspects of GHG emissions which lie beyond the provincial ambit. So that's what defines the POG jurisdiction, the national concern jurisdiction, uh, and I think lays a little bit of the groundwork for broader sets of policies from, from the federal government. At the same time, though, there's a lot of limiting in this decision for the ambit of the feds, in particular, the emphasis on the backstop nature of the policy and the really light touch of the federal government uh, that allowed this particular piece of legislation to satisfy the, the Crown-Zellerbach test. And then I think the last thing uh, that led to this sort of seeming three-day bun fight about whether or not there were taxes um, that we uh, see the, the court frame these clearly as regulatory charges. So uh, I'll leave you with a couple of other thoughts that I think are interesting. Uh, I really like that uh, light touch of the federal, federal jurisdiction, but I think it does raise some questions for, among other things, the policies proposed by the federal conservatives and the federal NDP. Are these likely to satisfy that? And, and if I were a, a journalist, that's a question I'd be asking to each of the federal leaders and even the provincial leaders right now. I think you saw the this Chief Justice struggle with the application of this minimum standards language quite a bit in the reasons, and, and I'm hoping to write something on that a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, I really like this framing of selective delegation. I think it's way better than minimum standards, and I wish they'd have, have gone through that. And lastly, I think I'll say that the dissent of Justice Rowe about the likelihood of challenging the regulations and the listing decisions I didn't agree with the majority's decision to dismiss that in the last couple paragraphs of the decision. I think it's really important and we're likely to see it. 
So that's uh, what I've got to say about that. Uh, chat tells me I have about a second left. So uh, that was a lot in a, in a very short period of time, but thank you very much and look forward to my fellow panelists expanding and, and elaborating on the decision. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, nice to be here and to continue this conversation. And I think uh, this is just another stage in what is going to be a long conversation because um, like probably many of you, I think I'm still digesting the full impact of this particular uh, judgment. And not only because it's uh, over 400 pages, but because uh, its contributions to Canadian federalism. And I think some of the debates that occur between the dissents and the majority opinion are going to give fodder for a lot of uh, constitutional analysis uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. So what I wanna say about this immensely important and complex uh, judgment that um, could take up an hour and a half of just uh, me talking away, um, I wanna really focus on, on two, um, two aspects. I could have chosen uh, 40, but the two that I wanna talk about are the new, old, new, slash revised, slash old fashioned uh, version of the National Concern Branch test of POG. It's a reboot or is it? Um, and the second is about some of the constitutional politics that flow from this particular judgment. We certainly saw, I think, evidence of those politics in the days following the judgment. And I think this, decision occasions us to reflect on uh, what it means to write constitutional law in uh, fractious uh, political times um, that I think we find ourselves in. So those are the two things I want to talk about in my uh, time. And uh, let me turn to the first one, which is uh, the National Concern Branch of POG. I detect in the judgment, really through both the majority and the dissenting opinions, a really curious relationship to the POG jurisprudence of the court. And perhaps especially Crown Zellerbach, the 1988 decision beloved by constitutional law students the world over. Um, and I mean the world. Um, Crown Zellerbach and the earlier decisions, I think, occupy a strange place in this judgment and really an inconsistent treatment um, that, that oscillates between a sense that the judgments of earlier uh, cases have been inconsistent and unclear and not provided uh, clear guidance to the sense that there is and always has been, or certainly since Crown Zellerbach, a distinct applicable test and that it must be applied in these circumstances. Um, to do justice to stereo decisis and um, the framers intent of POG. So those two things can't both be true, I don't uh, think. What I think is true is that POG has been used relatively rarely through Canada's constitutional history as a single ground of authority for federal legislation. But what is also true is that it has, it has a consistent history of application through Canadian constitutional law. It is not a new invention. It is as old as the division of powers. And indeed it has been used by courts to authorize federal laws in areas as diverse through our history as prohibition, aeronautics, the national capital region, atomic energy, marine dumping, there are probably others. And so to find that POG is somehow new, I think misunderstands that long history. At the same time, the sense that Crown Zellerbach and, that earl and those earlier decisions have provided a clear template on how POG is to be applied in unique and ever-changing circumstances, I think, cannot be sustained. What is true is that POG has also always come with a caution from courts, that, that courts using its power needs to find ways to circumscribe or limit its expansiveness. The very words themselves, peace, order, and good government are capable of 
enabling an immense array of possible legislative subjects. It can't mean all of those things and still operate in tandem with the division of powers, which protects provincial jurisdiction. So defining and limiting POG has been, I think, one of the underlying currents through Canadian constitutional jurisprudence. But I think it's not only in POG that we see that effort or indeed see that thread because similar concerns and similar efforts have also animated the court's approach to the trade and commerce power. Taken literally, trade and commerce encompasses most of what courts have decided is provincial jurisdiction under property and civil rights. Similarly, the criminal law power, which could potentially criminalize through the mere manner of creating an offense with a penalty, could move the federal government into a vast array of legislative fields. Again, the courts have found through our history that it's important to find ways to both give effect to the meaning of the words of the text that grant those powers to the federal government and to limit their ambit. I see exactly the same dynamic taking place through the history of Hogg. How they have done so is by trying to recognize that there is a jurisdiction that exists, but one that is not all encompassing. And so in restating that power in this decision, the court uses the template of Crown Zellerbach, but I fundamentally disagree with the portions of the dissent, which again, I think inconsistently, at points suggest that Crown Zellerbach is a clear and discernible test. I defy you to find the clear test that emerges out of Crown Zellerbach. I've been marking exams for 15 years in which I've given students that struggle. And um, I don't think it's plausible to say that any such test emerged from our earlier cases. What then the court does is find that there must be a matter of sufficient national concern they define that as being topics that are subjects that are inherently national and that transcend provincial uh, uh, powers. Um, and then this is taken directly out of Crown Zellerbach that matters must be single, distinctive, and indivisible. And how is such a, a characteristic to be operationalized? Uh, I think the court, again, drawing from bro both anti-inflation reference and from Crown Zellerbach says, well, you can't hand over the environment under POG or productivity or healthcare or matters that are broadly stated, which are themselves just aggregates of other potential jurisdictional subjects. That remains the law. But emphasizing and taking up a, a element that Crown Zellerbach identified as a variable the new decision in the greenhouse gas reference case says it's not just a variable, it is a precondition. There has to be an analysis that provinces are incapable of collectively legislating in relation to this particular problem. And it's not simply because that provinces can't do things on a national basis. We know by definition provinces cannot do things nationally. They cannot in, enforce uniform national standards. So the provincial inability is not simply a sense that the provinces are not able to do something nationally. They simply never can. The, the provincial inability test is about asking, is this subject that is something that has ramifications, if not dealt with nationally, ramifications that are serious and, and definable on other partners in confederation. That is that if a province doesn't act, other provinces will feel the potentially negative adverse impacts of those decisions. Finally, a scale of impact analysis this is the third portion of the test in which the court asks, as Crown Zellerbach does, does the finding that there is a federal aspect under the national concern branch, is that reconcilable with the division of powers? Or have we upended and taken away too much power from provinces to be able to manage the important portions of Section 92? 
the portion of this analysis that draws criticism in the dissent, and that I also think is unwise, is where Justice Wagner and the majority say, and we should also evaluate how important this topic is when deciding whether that will outweigh the cost to provincial jurisdiction. Like the dissent, I am worried that that introduces an unhelpful subjectivity into the analysis where I would prefer the court to remain fixated on the question of operability. What is it about this subject that cannot be dealt with provincially, as opposed to, is this something we wish was federal? I'm hopeful that that second factor is something that is not uh, uh, taken up uh, in, in future uh, cases. I have a minute or two left to say what I think uh, flows from that observation, which is, which is that there are refinements to the POG test taken up by the majority, but that is what courts do when they revisit decisions, especially once every 30 years, and it is what they have done under every other head of power. Nothing is static in a constitutional jurisprudence. The Framers of Confederation, a 19th century document which attempted in its own efforts to understand how to organize the world, was never and has never been a set of instructions that courts simply press a button and uh, the results uh, speak for themselves. Uh, interpreting and applying the division of powers is always one of defining relationships. And that's why I think there are troubling aspects, particularly in Justice Rowe and Justice Brown's dissents, that describe what the majority judgment has done in applying the law, as you can see the list of adjectives, um, in fact, beyond the Constitution itself. It is, in effect, the accusation that this is an unconstitutional judgment about the Constitution. And I think that's just not sustainable, given our history. And I think it's particularly unwise in a moment of tensions in the Federation, because it's exactly that point that was picked up by Premier Kenny in the minutes following the decision in which he accused the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada of not only bias against the province of Alberta, but of inventing federal powers. Indeed, creating an, ex an exemption to the constitutional order. That is not a healthy state of constitutional politics. And our Supreme Court of Canada has to be mindful and should be mindful of that when they write judgments of this magnitude. Look forward to hearing from my other panelists. Nira, I'll hand the floor to you. All right. Sorry. Sorry for this. Uh... Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, I have a few comments to make about the, um, uh, the reference. And so far, I could say that um, I agree with, uh, with my co-panelists' uh, um, impressions uh, so far. So the first thing I wanted to do is um, short uh, media stir coverage of uh, of the, of the reference in, um, in Quebec. So the first article by Conrad Yakubuski, who also has a column in Le Devoir, uh, he titles his piece Le Dernier Mot. So basically he says that uh, provinces are now weakened uh, in front of the, uh, of the new uh, the central government's uh, tools to impose its own will, that um, national norms in healthcare are just a matter of time, basically, if we rely on this judgment, Basically, Ottawa could use Article 91 of the Constitution to declare that uh, the treatment of elders in uh, long-term uh, care facilities has to be uh, governed by minimum standards uh, across, uh, across Canada. As well, Emmanuel Latraverse uh, for the Journal de Montréal titles her piece Le Cheval de Trois Fédérales, so a Trojan horse allowing future intervention in provincial fields, uh, including long-term care facilities, even potentially expanding it to uh, constitutional ruling on the Laicity Act and so on. Benoit Dutrizac for Le Devoir also talks about the victory of national norms. And he says today it's the environment, tomorrow it's gonna to be healthcare, education, uh, 
uh, childcare or uh, the regulation of national resources. And basically um, all three quote from Justice Brown and Rose notion of supervisory federalism. And they weren't against it, obviously. So the question I, first question I, I wanted to raise is can provincial inability exist whenever parliament provides for minimum national standards? This is um, a claim made by Justice Rowe. And this is also, uh, you know, what scares a lot of people uh, in Quebec and in probably other regions as well in Canada. And uh, the answer is probably not. <laughs> so first, uh, I think I have to point out to the clarification by the majority of, of the court. Uh, the court seeks to reassure provinces that a strong factual matrix must be shown in order for a matter of national dimensions to be recognized. And the assertion of jurisdiction has to be based on evidence and not mere conjectures. And this, I think, echoes the first securities reference, uh, which uh, had rejected the Attorney General of Canada's argument that uh, the general regulation of securities had, you know, over the years become a matter of national concern uh, under Section 91.2, the trade and commerce power. And so in that decision, the court had rejected uh, the claim because according to the court, it, there wasn't sufficient evidence provided. The other reason why I think it's the answer is no, is because of the um, of the absence of a risk of extra provincial effect. And so health and education regulation have primarily intra-provincial impacts. Hence, uh, they could hardly become national dimensions matter. And if you read paragraph 209 of the decision, you have the, the impression that Justice Wagner's majority opinion actually anticipates all these, uh, these uh, um, arguments uh, that uh, would arise eventually following the decision and, the, and uh, the, uh, the concern that this newly found minimum national norms jurisdiction would be extended to other fields. And so this has not been helped by uh, uh, a statement by Prime Minister Trudeau that, uh, you know, when it comes to the health of, uh, of people, uh, the, there is no division of powers. So it was just a, an unfortunate uh, statement. Um, <clears throat> I think the decision brings about two major changes. Uh, and um, the first one relates to double aspect, which now can apply to a matter of national concern. So this is related to the criteria of distinctiveness, which uh, Eric just talked about. So there is no um, need anymore to talk about uh, plenary transfer of powers. And this is done in view to, of course, minimizing the impact of the decision on provincial autonomy. So I think this is, a, this is a, something that should be noted as a major change brought about by the decision. The other is the role of extra-provincial harm. So extra-provincial harm returns often in the decision. It is related to the criteria of provincial inability and all the other criteria as well, including in the final balancing stage where it returns and it plays the role of a federal aspect as we will see. So before I go on to talk about the, uh, the risk of extra provincial harm, I just want to return briefly to double aspect. So I had the impression by reading the majority decision that the matter, unfortunately, had become a, a moving target. So in the beginning, when the majority stresses that POG does not transfer plenary ju jurisdiction, it defines a narrow pit in substance. It says that it is the establishing of minimum standards uh, of greenhouse gas, price stringency in order to reduce emissions. So this is the pit and substance, so the matter of the law. But then it also recognizes, uh, and that's a, you know, uh, a novelty, that national dimension matters can have a double aspect. The problem, as you can see, is that there is no, there can be no provincial aspect to a matter defined in paragraph 57 because it's too narrow. <laughs> That's why later in the ruling, the matter becomes more generally the regulation of greenhouse gas pricing. And this matter could have both a provincial aspect and a distinct federal aspect. So this creates a lot of confusion. And this is why Justice Brown refers to it as a constitutional impossibility. So I think it would have been better to drop the criterion of a matter uh, distinctively different from provincial ones, such as it has been applied in prior case law. Uh, instead of doing that, uh, the court sort of uh, tried to, uh, I think in the end, creates more confusion about the criterion of uh, distinctiveness. 
It would have been better if the court had simply recognized that POG applies to matters that have both provincial and federal aspects, and thus that are both within provincial and federal jurisdiction. The aspects are different, but the matter is the same. Uh, I think in the end that the wording of section 91 supports this view, uh, but I'm not gonna get into uh, this argument specifically uh, in, uh, in the few minutes that I have. So if we turn to the other major change, it's the recognition of the risk of a grave extra-provincial harm. Uh, and I believe this is underlying the whole of the new POG test. First of all, it underlines distinctiveness because the court says quite clearly that the risk of harm is a key consideration of distinctiveness. It says that if the matter has extra-provincial character, it is qualitatively different from provincial matters then the risk of grave extra-provincial harm is also underlying indivisibility. Here the analysis is circular, I grant you, the matter is indivisible if there is provincial inability. But the court also clarifies that indivisibility, as was explained in crown Zutterbeck, has nothing to do with ascertaining the physical boundaries of a matter. Um, the extra-provincial um, effect played an essential role in Ledin's analysis of indivisibility is a statement made by uh, the Wagner majority, but I don't think it is reflected in the uh, opinion of uh, Justice Ledin in uh, Crown's letter back. Uh, Justice Ledin had specifically, you know, um, focused on the physical difficulty of ascertaining the sources of pollution. But in, the, in any event, indivisibility is clarified. And then um, the third criterion of inability, provincial inability, is also linked to uh, grave extra-provincial harm. And here, um, one of the major takeaways of the decision is that provincial inability, like Eric said, is now a new, is now a different uh, standalone factor, and not only an indicia of an indicium of uh, of the other three uh, um, criteria that the court had already established. And so um, in, when it comes to provincial inability, the court also extend this grave extra provincial harm, not only to um, the regulatory scheme, but also to the Canadian citizens. And I think that's also something new. So in my impression, the court is leaning towards subsidiarity, the subsidiarity principle, but not, uh, not uh, mentioning it even once. So, um, I think uh, the, um, it's, it's still relevant to talk about the principle of subsidiarity, even though the court doesn't mention it, um, because there are a lot of uh, convergence points between subsidiarity and the new POC test. So first of all, uh, it's defined in the Article 5 of the EU Treaty as uh, in areas which do not fall within its ex exclusive competence. Um, Subsidiarity allows the union to, to take action only if and insofar as the objectives of a proposed action cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states and can rather, by reason of scale or effects, uh, be better achieved by the union. Nura, yes. time in, in minute. There is. Okay, so I'm done, almost done. Okay. So, uh, as you know, um, subsidiarity is often invoked in Supreme Court of Canada case law, but it's a, it has a very weak... Uh, uh, it plays a very weak and uncertain role. So this could have been an opportunity to uh, be more specific about, uh, about subsidiarity. Um, a companion to subsidiarity is proportionality. In Europe, central authority only intervenes no more than what is strictly necessary. And within subsidiarity analysis, a strong empirical proof is always necessary. And the probability of non-cooperation between member states is one element in the assessment. And finally, in the EU, it only applies to concurrent matters. So you see that there's quite a lot of, uh, of uh, convergence points between the two. There was no need to endorse subsidiarity, obviously. There's a lot of things to do in that decision before <laughs> incorporating another constitutional principle. Um, although I've argued that uh, perhaps it was a good opportunity to do so in a forthcoming piece. Uh, but uh, I think there is um, a lack of, uh, of um, uh, clarity, if I can say, uh, 
on the side of the of the, of the majority of the court because by promoting an ability to a full-fledged criterion and by elevating the risk of harm to a principle underlying POG, it's not simply following prior case law. And by finding double aspect compatible with POG, it's not simply following prior case law. Though it is correct in doing so, it could have been more candid uh, in uh, doing in, in just you know, recognizing that it is it is revamping the POC test and it is not simply a clarification of the prior case law. Uh, Justice Rowe sums it well at paragraph 571. He says that his point of view and the majority's point of view is different. And he explains why. But in the end, he says these views are fundamentally different, but neither follows directly from the case law. So I think if there is an opportunity that was missed is the one uh, that you could see now on screen. Basically, I did, when I finished reading, have the impression that the court was trying to pass a camel uh, through the eye of a needle, and that it would have been perhaps easier uh, to understand for us and for our students if the court had been more uh, straightforward about what it was really doing with the national concern tests of, uh, of POG. Well, thanks a lot for your attention. Sorry, I rushed in the end, sorry. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And, and thank you to um, Eric and Nora and Andrew um, for their comments. So my comments are really going to be focused on, um, on uh, Indigenous peoples and their role or, or perspective on this decision. So I'm going to roll through it. I do have some slides, um, mostly pictures, just because I wanted to, uh, to, to spruce it up here or there. So um, and um, just to set the stage, we know we see in the intervening factums of um, a number of Indigenous nations and organizations just about the effect of climate change, um, human um, uh, affected climate change, um, especially northern communities. Um, so in the um, Athabasca Chippewan First Nations factum, it talks about um, this range of, uh, of, of temperature going up almost seven degrees by 2080. Um, we know in the Yukon, there, the winter temperatures there have raised by um, 4.5 degrees Celsius as well. A number of other issues like permafrost, um, ice flows, et cetera, for northern communities as well. So vitally important for Indigenous nations. And I actually wanted to pull out towards um, uh, pretty further to go back to actually 1867 here. And so when you go to my slides here, there we go. Um, so here's Canada Confederation. So what we're talking about to here, 91 and 92, sections 91 and 92 of the British North America Act. This is what um, Canada looked like. And the interests of these nations, I only selected Inuit territories here on this next slide. So you can think and, uh, in these accords in Charlottetown and Quebec when they're, they're setting out this division of powers that's at this case here. Um, here's the interest of the land, of just the of the Inuit here. Um, so there's a number of interveners there as well. So, so I really appreciate Eric's comments when he talks about um, this being, and I wrote it down here because I like the wording, a document on how to organize the world. And you can see how the worlds are so so different here as well. And so this is the challenge for Indigenous nations when they're intervening. In this case is how do they get themselves into, into this world essentially here? Um, and so you can see this wide disparity here. And so to put it another way, which one of my colleagues, John Burroughs talks about this, is um, this, this disconnect between the assertion of crown sovereignty that we see and, um, and also what we know as a reconciliation according to section 35. Um, and uh, again, talks about this as some kind of legal vacuum um, must be imagined to create this title. And so, so really that is at the heart of this claim. Um, you can see the intervening factums of a number of indigenous nations and organizations here is really trying to uh, make room, representation, manipulate, whatever words we wanna use to, to, to puncture this, right, in this case. And so that's the background. So what we see is, um, and I just pulled uh, this from one factum here. This was the Assembly of First Nations factum. Um, but uh, generally the position of a number of interveners um, on behalf of Indigenous nations and um, organizations really see this, this, this question of interprovincial um, or this provincial inability as, uh, as being holding the interest um, of, of First Nations here um, in, in this factum here. So disproportionate harms that First Nations do suffer here by substandard provincial action. So really tying um, 
providing um, leverage for that argument um, for the federal government here. So we see a number of the factums do this in one way or another in that standard. Um, what, what was interesting with the, at the factums uh, is the position that um, intervening um, uh, parties took as well. And, and I've kind of, I've summarized them here to think about um, talking about 91 and 92. And so that, that um, probably a bad metaphor in the time of um, needles uh, that we are in, but puncturing this, this 91 and 92 is really this, this question about the relationship between section 35 and um, section 91 and 92. Obviously, um, uh, people are taking this up because that is a, it's a, a constitutional provision um, to have to give that weight. So, so there's various language about this, about harmonizing 91 and 92 with section 35. And there was some, um, some creative advocacy that was going on here. So, um, so for example, the Athabasca Chippewan um, First Nation, they argue that um, section 35 should supplement 91 and 92. It's not making a new head of power here. Um, but um, it, should, there, it should be taken into consideration when we're considering um, these questions of, of federalism here. So in, in their factum, they're talking about their treaty rights and the, the diminishment of their treaty rights to hunt and fish um, to, um, for substance on their territory, and, and that should be considered within here as well. Um, uh, the Assembly of First Nation talked about the honor of the Crown applying as well to, to um, how the court is looking at the relationship between 91 and 92 as well. So, so what we know in the decision, none of this was successful. Um, we don't see any big rulings on here. We actually do see a little bit of this taken up by um, uh, both the um, majority and the um, dissenting opinions. And the dissenting opinions actually latch on to some of the alternative arguments that we do see in um, in these factums as well to make those arguments um, that we see uh, Roe and um, uh, I don't know why it's escaping my mind right now. Brown talking about uh, um, uh, the gap branch and, and, and that consideration as well. So they pull that in there. So not successful here. Um, a tough one to, uh, to, re to recreate the sort of cooperative federalism scheme, the case here. Um, so um, uh, Indigenous nations are going away with a happy result in terms of protections of environments, but not necessarily in this relationship. And, and so I just all wanted to draw us to um, it really, again, that sort of representation in this the struggle here is up to the will of the federal government here. And, and we know just a short history before, so Harper's federal government, that we were on the flip side, uh, Indigenous nations were on the flip side of, of, um, of protesting, advocating for more environmental protections here. So this is the Idle No More movement that occurred across Canada there. And that was in response to the federal government taking the opposite approach to environmental protections, um, pulling back on them as well. And so, um, so maybe not the right case to put forward those conversations about uh, redefining cooperative federalism where Indigenous peoples have more representation um, there, um, but nonetheless something that will continue throughout. So um, I'm going to stop there and hopefully it'll lead to um, some conversation as well and uh, looking forward to Jocelyn's uh, comments. Thanks so much for that, Darcy. So let me just share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. All right, well, thank you. And what a privilege to be presenting alongside such fantastic uh, panelists here today. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation to come back to the Center for Constitutional Studies to present again, although I'm joining you from Vancouver and the uh, traditional ancestral and, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people where I am a grateful though uninvited guest. So I approach this litigation from the perspective of environmental law and what I thought I would do is try to put this decision in the context of climate litigation more generally. So I'm going to frame these remarks around the idea that climate change is legally disruptive and I'll explain that in, in a moment. And I'll begin to, I'll highlight where, where I think the majority's decision begins to grapple with that disruption in ways that are relevant for future uh, climate litigation. So you can see that I've got sort of three, I'll highlight three points there for you. Canada and uh, uh, courts in Canada and around the world um, have to adjudicate on the legal aspects of 
uh, government action with respect to climate change. These legal uh, challenges are happening and will continue to happen and almost certainly will increase in, in number in the years to come. And you might be familiar with some of them, right? So some of them that come to mind are the, the youth um, charter challenges, climate charter challenges. Um, they might be Section 35 claims, as Darcy has alluded to, brought by Aboriginal peoples or other cases that seek to bring um, Indigenous laws to bear on um, climate change related issues. They could be industry challenges, which of course we've seen already, um, or whatever innovations the Alberta War Room dreams up next. So these um, cases are happening and they're gonna continue to happen. And so I guess the question that interests me is how does this decision lay a foundation for these cases and, and where does it uh, fall short? So um, let's start with the idea that climate change is a legally disruptive phenomenon. Um, we tend to think about uh, climate change as being biophysically disruptive, right? Floods, wildfires, heat waves, droughts, etc. Socially disruptive, right? The way that those kinds of external threats affect us, right? Climate migration, job losses, evacuations, all of these kinds of things. But we need to pay attention to the ways in which climate change is necessarily, inevitably, legally disruptive as a result of the widespread social changes that, um, that it will bring. And so, about climate change, um, Fisher, Scott, Scottford and Barrett have argued that it's highly polycentric, uncertain, socio-politically charged and dynamic nature presents particular challenges for legal orders and adjudication. And they say that jurists need to be alert to the ways in which climate litigation really tests the boundaries of existing legal doctrines and perhaps forces evolution beyond just simply application. So what does the Supreme Court of Canada have to say about the legally disruptive nature of climate change? Um, well, here's a quote that I kind of like, no, this is easier than Crown Zeller back, right? Okay, perhaps not easier, right? You can see that I'm paraphrasing. And as you've heard from the other panelists, there's a lot going on in this decision as the court grapples with the creative legislative design here as Andrew's nicely laid out for us. So despite this quote, right, there's actually quite a bit of evidence of legal disruption. There are at least half a dozen um, different pith and substance characterizations in play. Um, and as others have discussed, right, the court really revisits the fundamentals of the peace order and good government power, and the national concern branch test to revise and re-articulate sort of guiding principles for that test. So there is evidence of legal disruption happening in this case. But what about this is relevant um, to the climate litigation, um, you know, which we, which we anticipate will bring further legal disruption. So the first point I'm calling grasping the nettle. Uh, and this point is that the majority does not shy away from the scale, complexity, or severity of climate disruption. There's strong language throughout the majority's reasons, including this quote that I've got up on the screen, all parties to this proceeding agree that climate change is an existential challenge. It is a threat to the highest, of, of the highest order to the country and indeed the world. And then at the end, the undisputed existence of a threat um, to the future of humanity cannot be ignored. So I know that to some of you, this seems really basic and I wish that I didn't have to dwell on this kind of point, but this type of recognition by the Supreme Court of Canada was not a given. So only a decade ago, we had the federal courts dismissing climate change, ch climate challenges on just ordinary administrative law grounds on the basis that those kinds of cases were not justiciable. We currently have climate rights litigation being halted by the courts on at the motion to strike stage. And there were arguments in this case, right, brought by those challenging the GGPPA um, that encouraged the court to uh, either downplay responsibility for climate change or hide behind the complexity and scale of the problem. And the good news is the majority rejected that framing. So here's one really good passage and where we see this quite clearly. Furthermore, I reject the notion that because climate change is an inherently global problem, each individual province's greenhouse gas emissions cause no measurable harm or do not have tangible impacts on other provinces. Each province's emissions are clearly measurable and contribute to climate change the underlying logic of this argument would apply equally to all sources of emissions everywhere, and so it must fail. So the first way in which this decision is relevant to the legal disruption of climate change, we have the top court actually engaging with the legal dimensions of climate change 
seeing that serious engagement woven throughout the legal analysis. The second feature of this decision that I wanna highlight is the court's recognition that all levels of government need to have the constitutional space to uh, address climate change. This has been a consistent theme across the Supreme Court's environmental federalism cases. Um, and that is you know, a, a, a recognition that constitutional interpretation needs to ensure there's space for federal, provincial and intern municipal governments to address pressing environmental problems, including climate change. And the quote up there is from the Hydro-Quebec decision now almost 25 years ago. But the asterisk um, represents the vital point that Darcy has just made so well, right? And that is the absence of indigenous governments, jurisdiction and indigenous laws from this environmental federalism jurisprudence. And so the majority's decision here keeps with this trend, right? It's consistent in the, in, in the sense that you can see in the majority's reasoning on the, on the matter, the determination that the matter here has a real and not a nominal federal perspective to it. So there needs to be constitutional space for, um, for the federal government to act. More than this though, um, we now have a majority decision which affirms that creative design for climate legislation is constitutionally possible. Um, you know, I think Andrew had uh, introduced this, that this kind of legislation has not really, has not been tried before. It's quite unique in its design. And so here's how the majority describes the scheme. And this is, comes in at the scale of impact analysis. And the majority says under the GGPPA, Provinces and territories are free to design and legislate any greenhouse gas pricing system as long as it meets minimum national standards of price stringency. If a province wants uh, to exceed the federal standards, it's free to do so without fear of federal legislation rendering its legislation inoperative because the federal matter concerns minimum standards, not maximums. The federal matter thus deals with GHG pricing stringency in a way that relates only to the risk of non-cooperation and the attendant risk of grave uh, extra provincial harm. So this is exactly what we need to respond to climate disruption. And that is the kind of flexibility that allows all levels of government to take needed action, right? But ensures that minimum protection against uh, extra territorial harm. And so here we have that recognition that different design here, creative legislative design does not mean that it's unconstitutional. And then my final point. So one of the ways in which climate change is legally disruptive is through the amplification of harms that are already disproportionately felt across gender, race, socioeconomic and ability lines. And um, in September, when uh, we, uh, some of us met on a, CS, uh, on a Center for Constitutional Studies panel, I spoke about the important arguments made by interveners and the opportunity that this case presented for reading the Constitution as a whole. Darcy has highlighted some of those arguments as well, right? Understanding how um, federalism is part of a set of sort of interlocking constitutional principles, including constitutional responsibilities to those that are marginalized by state action. And, and so there was a lot to work with and Darcy's given you a sense um, of that in terms of the intervener factums. Those submissions are not incorporated in any robust way into the majority's decision, but the majority's focus on grave extra, grave extra, extra provincial harms is I think quite important to future climate justice claims. And I wanna highlight um, just one quote with apologies to Eric because um, he and I, I think, have different views on what's likely to happen with this passage from the majority's reason. So this is, again, from the scale of impact analysis. It is the balancing feature that um, Eric highlighted in his remarks. So although this restriction may interfere with the province's preferred balance between economic and environmental considerations, it is necessary to consider the interests that would be harmed owing to irreversible consequences for the environment, for human health and safety, and for the economy, if Parliament were unable to constitutionally address the matter at a national level. This irreversible harm would be felt across the country and would be borne disproportionately by vulnerable communities and regions with profound effects on Indigenous peoples, on the Canadian Arctic and on Canada's coastal regions. In my view, the impact on those interests justifies the limited constitutional impact on provincial jurisdiction. So 
maybe setting aside the question about whether this kind of balancing test or justification test belongs in the national concern branch uh, analysis, one of the things that we can say for sure is that this kind of justification requirement permeates Canadian public law, right? It's a requirement of administrative law reasonableness. We see it in charter analysis. It comes up in Aboriginal and treaty rights infringement. Um, and so we can absolutely expect, right, that, um, that this passage, right, where we see the majority um, finding that irreversible um, uh, and, harm, and, and important environmental harms that fall on vulnerable peoples, right, can outweigh um, other factors, which, um, you know, is not often the case in environmental cases, actually balancing tests and, and make it very difficult for um, the intangible and sometimes diffuse uh, environmental consequences of decisions to really resonate in legal tests. And so um, I think uh, this, this passage in particular by the majority, recognizing this vulnerability, recognizing the need for government responses that address that vulnerability provides a really important doctrinal toehold moving forward as we watch um, climate litigation unfold across the country. So thanks for that, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you so much, all of you. This was, uh, boy, there was a lot of material presented there. And so I'm just going to ask a few questions, but I know that one of our panelists, Andrew, has a question for uh, perhaps, uh, New uh, was it Jocelyn and, uh, or Darcy? And I thought maybe, Andrew, you might want to start by asking that question. Uh, of, of one of our panelists, either Darcy or Jocelyn. Go ahead. Sure, I guess I get to still be a student here and, and ask the experts, but I was really curious how some of, and Jocelyn, you touched on this in the end of your uh, comments, but more I think in the, in the climate justice frame, but I'm really curious how some of the uh, framing in the majority decision around impacts on indigenous communities in particular how that might feed into some of the other legislation that's coming up for, for judicial review. So the C-69 and the question of a climate test within federal environmental assessment legislation in reading those passages in the majority, I mean, they're basically saying anything that is significant from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective is de facto significant in terms of the, the federal government's um, honor the crown due to indigenous peoples, et cetera. Is that a, is that a fair interpretation? Darcy, do you want to weigh in on that one first, thinking about the challenge to the Impact Assessment Act? Yeah, so I mean, I, so I will say I haven't thought about that far ahead of, uh, of Bill C-69 and that challenge, but there is that language where they are connecting um, the impact on Indigenous communities in the majority here. And so I do see that for sure. They're, they're, they're laying some grounds for that to enter into whatever proportionality um, balancing, uh, et cetera, that they're going to do in there. Um, so I'm going to think about this a little bit more. I'm going to maybe, Jocelyn, do you have anything to say? And maybe I'll jump back in. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a great question, Andrew. And, um, and I, also, I think I'd like to digest those paragraphs and the majority's reasons um, a little bit more, the, I think, the way that you have. I think, um, you know, what this, the majority's reasons here, I, I think, tell us about, you know, the challenge to Bill C-69 is that um, I, what I hope is that we can expect more of the same, right, which is that we recognize that there are valid provincial and federal aspects to environmental regulation, right, and that, um, uh, and that, since the Friends of the Old Man River decision back in the early 90s, we've recognized that there is a legitimate constitutional role for the federal government in, um, in studying and assessing major projects, right, before exercising its jurisdiction um, in all of its spheres of authority, whether it's fisheries or, you know, federal undertakings or, or what have you. So um, I think that this the, the majority's reasons overall, I think, should give us some confidence that um, that 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 challenge, you know, will also come up come up short. Recognizing that, you know, the Impact Assessment Act is not a significant change from what it was structurally, right, from from what it was before. 
Yeah, and so, so thank you, Jocelyn, and for giving me time to digest the question a little bit more as well. Uh, and I, I kind of think about uh, the, uh, um, what I'd want to see is a little more discussion about, like we don't really have a discussion about the honor of the crown. We know for Bill C-69, even just the, um, the, um, the gender analysis that has occurred in there and that is impacts indigenous communities as well. So um, like a hopefully, if there is these, this analysis that is going down this, that it's really engaging with those and giving us something to work with other than just being like, this impacts indigenous communities. So it's important, right? It's kind of where we're at here with, but so promising, but um, hopefully uh, more of an analysis. Thanks. Okay, so Andrew, I'm just curious to know, um, something that's been asked of us a couple of times at the center is, how is the federal government going to decide whether or not a provincial scheme actually meets muster. So for example, uh, Saskatchewan had a scheme that it put forward uh, years ago when the federal government said, no, that just does not, that does not meet the standard. So, so for example, Alberta's talking about cap and trade, et cetera. So can you answer that question? Uh, I can't give you a definitive answer. They, they have a, a benchmarking process right now that I think they now know they're going to have to revisit. And Minister Wilkinson has said as much in, in recent interviews uh, where they're basically from their, their benchmarking, they're looking at effectively how much does it cost you as a business or an individual if you increase your emissions by one ton or how much does it save you if you reduce your emissions? And then in a related way, what share of emissions in the province are covered by that policy. So if it covers a, you know, 70 ish percent of emissions and puts a price on those emissions as comparable to the federal price, then sort of it's going to pass muster. But the big challenge I think that you're seeing come forward is to what degree will the federal government look at what other changes provincial governments make? So New Brunswick is the, is the key actor here. They basically relabeled their provincial gas tax, a carbon tax for all intents and purposes. And the federal government said, okay, well you pass muster on the carbon pricing regime. Now Saskatchewan is gonna look to do that. Premier Kenny has intimated that maybe they would look to do something here along the same lines. Uh, so that's gonna be a big problem. And Minister Wilkinson has referred to that as a loophole that they have to close. Um, and then of course, there's the question of, of cap and trade that the price in Quebec's cap and trade regime right now, I think is, is floored anyway at around $17 US for 2021, whereas the uh, GGPPA price is jumping up to $40 a ton here tomorrow. And so, you know, are we going to allow, or is the federal government going to allow that selection where the provinces with low or declining emissions kind of select themselves into cap and trade regimes and have a low price whereas the provinces with higher emissions or, or different sectors are pinned into the, um, the, carbon, the higher carbon price. So I think that, that question that how do you get on that schedule, right? It, it drives right into Justice Rowe's dissent, Justice Cote's dissent. And I think, uh, you know, my sense is the majority was wrong to dismiss that out of hand. I think you're right, it wasn't the, or the, they're right, it wasn't the subject of this particular appeal but getting that regulatory process right and being able to document it in the sort of Vavilov style is going to be a real challenge for the, for the federal government. Great, thank you. Um, now, I just want to remind our, uh, the, the audience members watching that if you have a question, please do use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen uh, and, and, and do ask uh, questions. So in the meantime, I have one here for Eric. And just wondering if you wanted to comment on Nora's critique of the court's decision with respect to the double aspect doctrine. Um, yeah, I think, I think great, thanks for the question. And I obviously listened closely to Nora's comments on them. I may be a little less convinced that it's quite a new branching out um, uh, on the double aspect doctrine. And I say that because, it, and, well, let me back up. There are certainly uh, portions of judgment, uh, judgments uh, about POG, and there are certainly scholarly comments on those judgments, which indicate that there is no room for double aspect and that, that plenary jurisdiction means that the federal government occupies the entire space and that um, therefore any, any provincial activity in that jurisdictional space 
once it's handed over to the federal government, now the, the provinces uh, have no more room. And in effect, anything that the provinces uh, were legislating in that area would now be in fact ultra virus. There, there are, the, you can find those comments. However, those aren't the only comments you can find um, about POG, both in the case law and the commentary of it. So there are equally, and I think in fact, the dominant stream is one which recognizes that double aspect has always occurred in some form or other in relation to um, in relation to national concern branch matters. So right back to right back to prohibition, which was the first subject of the national concern branch. Um, the provinces were recognized as having their own jurisdiction in relation to alcohol, in relation to alcohol control, in relation to prohibition. It simply wasn't only a federal matter. There were aspects of that matter that were federal. There were aspects of that matter that were provincial. And you can go down the list from uh, atomic energy and uh, the national capital region uh, and marine dumping. And I think you can find yourself in the same, in the same boat, which is that, is that there's a maintenance of provincial jurisdiction in relation to the provincial aspects of those subjects. Um, Crown Zellerbach uses the language of plenary, but also quotes extensively from Professor Dale Gibson, who had a, uh, a conception that there was a double aspect in relation to the National Concern Branch. So um, for me, it's, a, it, it's, it's an important finding that the double aspect exists, um, but it's, it's not a new finding. Did you want to respond to that, Nora, at all? Yes, sir. Sure. I, I agree, actually, with a lot of what Eric says. And uh, I think the problem is the, the criterion of distinctiveness, that the matter has to be distinct from uh, provincial matters. This is what has created a lot of confusion because in its application, it is true that um, you know, several aspects have been recognized in all those cases that Eric mentions, but officially the test still requires distinctiveness. And this is what was confusing in Crown Zellerbach and in other cases is that you know, on the one hand, the court says, you know, the matter has to be distinct from provincial matters. But on the other hand, it recognizes that it's the same matter, but it has several aspects to it. Now it just, I think it's more straightforward. It just, you know, recognizes what it's been doing all, the, all this time, but still without, uh, you know, um, discarding distinctiveness. Distinctiveness is still a criterion, but now it has a new meaning. I'm just saying that would have been probably easier for the court to acknowledge that so it's the same matter. So that matter, it's not a distinct federal or provincial matter. This, the matter is the same, but the aspects are different. And that way, I think it would have been much easier to explain to students. Because for us, for me, the biggest challenge is now getting back in class tomorrow. After last Thursday, I finished explaining the anti-inflation reference and crowns that are back. Today, uh, tomorrow, sorry, I have to get back to my students with an update. And this is complicated when you have one judge like Justice Brown uh, saying that what the majority recognizes is a constitutional impossibility. And then you have this debate, do we have two branches of POG or we have three branches of POG? So everything is, uh, is, uh, is, is more complicated when you do have to explain it to first year law students. And uh, this is our challenge in the next few years. Okay, thank you very much for that, for that response. Gosh, there's uh, so many interesting uh, questions coming in here. I just, uh, just quickly wanted to ask Darcy, uh, and may maybe this is an unfair question, but uh, do, you, do you think coming out of this decision that Indigenous people are going to have more or less confidence in the court's understanding of their need for recognition of jurisdiction within the federal structure? Yeah, so great question. I don't think it's unfair at all. Um, I would say that I, I you know, I, I can't speak for everybody out there. I think there, when I say that this might not be the right case, it's more so like a realistic approach that um, the issue here is just really it's this fed, the heart of federalism, right? And, and uh, um, so maybe not the right set of facts at the right time with the right judges to have, you know, 
a groundbreaking case that makes room within the constitutional order um, beyond Section 35 for Indigenous people. So I would say we're realists, I guess, um, about that and, and understanding that. So, um, so I mean, I, I think there are other avenues um, that are have to lay the groundwork before um, a court would be able to make some significant departure between this struggle between 91 and 92 in these in these aspects. And so a lot of that is politically, um, even just different sorts of recognition of the constitutional position of Indigenous peoples that has been throughout time. You can think about failed accords and et cetera, um, where that is. So, so a really great question. And I would say, I would say people are pretty realistic about it. I don't think this was, um, I think it was a, a good decision um, on what it provides um, within what it can provide um, for Indigenous nations that are under this threat that Jocelyn really talked really greatly about there, but also just an acknowledgement that there are other avenues where we can continue this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just one very quick question for you, Jocelyn, and I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to comment on uh, the the the, the something that you opened the door to earlier on and that had to do with administrative law and you noted uh, previously that you did not think the GGPPA's delegation of broad discretion uh, was problematic because of the role of administrative law and did you just want to very briefly I know that this is the subject of an entire other webinar really uh, but did you just want to briefly comment on that? Sure, it's always dangerous asking an administrative law professor to comment briefly on anything related to administrative law. But, uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's interesting that it, this did get quite a bit of time and the majority's reasons um, uh, in, in terms of the majority not being concerned about, um, not being concerned about the broad grant of discretion to the executive under the GGPPA because you know, concerns about the exercise of discretion can be dealt with through, you know, the ordinary administrative law doctrine most recently articulated in Vavilov. And so, um, you know, I think, I think that's right. I'm certainly hard pressed to think of other instances in which um, a constitutional analysis has, a federalism analysis has entailed thinking through all the bad faith ways in which an, a an act might be implemented and then ruling it unconstitutional on that basis. So I think, you know, if dubious exercises of discretionary power occur under the GGPPA, I think, you know, we can all look to Vavilov and the, you know, fairly robust requirements of justification that the, the court has set out in Vavilov. And just one quick comment on Cote's dissent to make sure that the dissents get a little bit of attention. So she dissents on this basis, right, on the, on, on the fact that the act delegates too much discretion. And I guess I'll just say that this is curious, uh, you know, she signed on to the uh, majority reasons in Vavilov, which clearly reject the idea that there's any such thing as wholly unfettered discretion granted through statute. So, um, you know, I, I, I just think that her, her administrative law uh, thinking on this is inconsistent with, uh, with Vavilov. Thank you. That was very brief and to the point. Thank you. <laughs> Now, there's a question being posed to all of you, and so please do feel free to weigh in on this one. Uh, the, uh, the person asks, I was wondering what the panelists thought about Justice, Just, Justice Brown's criticism that effectively the majority's decision endorses a federalism by supervision. Could this be a, quote, bad decision for a good cause, end quote? Anyone want to weigh in on that one? Eric? Well, I'll just take a first stab because um, I think part and parcel with that critique from Justice Brown's dissent is what he describes as a new federal power in relation to minimum standards, period. And that minimum standards are now have been recognized by the majority as federal jurisdiction. And why won't there be minimum standards about health care, about uh, traffic lights, about uh, I think at one point he says the curriculum of uh, grade five uh, history classes. Um, can't the federal government now do all of those things? Um, that I think is that that argument is then transported into this uh, phrase. It, it occurs in a number of places in Justice Rowe and Brown's dissent that what we've created is now supervisory um, federalism. 
Uh, well, I would say uh, two things. One is that I do not think minimum standards have been recognized by the majority as a ground of federal jurisdiction. Um, that's not a fair reading of what has occurred. And it's impossible to imagine that the federal government could enact legislation in relation to minimum standards as the pith and substance and be granted jurisdiction under POG. Um, it will not meet the POG requirements as set out in this case, and it is inconceivable that it would occur. Um, the second thing I would say is that is that paramountcy has always existed as uh, an ability to deal with conflicts between the inevitable, inevitable overlaps that occur between jurisdictions, federal and provincial. Is that supervisory federalism? Well, there has to be a mechanism, and we've had one for 100 and 50 years of granting the federal government a paramount authority in a discrete and narrow areas of conflict. That seems to me to be a highly workable uh, um, approach to our federal arrangements. And um, I don't think that uh, the monster in the closet is, uh, is as Justice Brown would suggest. I jump in on that one maybe for a quick second and say, you know, I think this is a a consistent issue with the framing of this legislation. It started with Ontario and Saskatchewan's reference of framing this as establishing minimum national standards. And that's really not what it does. It has a federal regulatory charge that's, that's applied with discretion and, or delegated with discretion if you, if you wanna frame it that way. And so that standards language has stuck around, but I think even Chief Justice Wagner is wrong in the sense, and that's a strong thing to say, I, I know, but I can't contemplate a way in which you'd have paramountcy triggered here and that provincial law would become inoperative. There's no sense in which provincial legislation, which isn't stringent, would be invalid. It just says the federal legislation is going to apply in your province. Same way we have overlapping federal and provincial legislation. And since there are no specific industrial requirements. There's no regulatory emissions limits or anything like that. There's no impossibility of simultaneous compliance. And so it feels to me like that's an artifact or a, a carryover from the Saskatchewan and Ontario Court of Appeal decisions that just is the wrong language for what this legislation does, but it's hung around and it tied the Chief Justice in knots in, in the majority reasons too. And, and I think Nora pointed that out well, that the Chief Justice sort of ex drops back and forth from that language, talks about minimum standards as the matter, and then a lot of the description actually fits better if it's just a federal regulatory charge on greenhouse gas emissions and full stop. And maybe I'll just um, chime in with a, a, a brief thought again, thinking about this from uh, the environmental law perspective and and the usefulness of this judgment for thinking through um, regulation of transboundary pollution more generally. So, um, you know, what's been said, I think, is exactly right. The majority's decision is very closely tied to extra provincial effects. And I guess my response is, is, is if the provinces are concerned about federal supervision, then it's on them to introduce environmental laws and enforce environmental laws that prevent those extra provincial harms from happening. And if they do that, then there's no impetus for a, you know, a, any sort of minimum standards, right? That it, to then federal minimum standards to then address those extra provincial harms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that was a robust response. Now, um, we have a question here for Andrew. Uh, you mentioned that the act was similar to the powers used by the federal government in relation to provincial tax regimes. So why not use the tax power and make it uh, the act a tax? Uh, well, I think the, the big limit on making the act a tax comes from the reasons for the act to be there in the first place. The act is very clearly aimed at reducing emissions. So as soon as you tick that box, you know, from an economics perspective, it's a carbon tax, right? That's what we would call it. That's how I teach it, et cetera. But from a constitutional perspective, when you're thinking of the, the Section 125 jurisprudence, it's not a tax for constitutional purposes. And I actually really liked, I think it's Justice Brown's dissent, uh, the framing, I hadn't really thought of this in this way before of, you know, if you say that the federal government can do anything it wants, including this with taxation, then 
it really broadens the authority of the federal government to delve very deeply into provincial matters. And if you say that anything's a tax and all the federal government needs to do is call it a tax, that's a big provincial, or that's a big federal hammer. Uh, the last thing I, I think I, I would maybe uh, point out here that's important is, of course, back to section 125, you call it a tax. And even if we did have a, a future government that did this and said, look, we're doing this, primarily for reasons to uh, improve the efficiency of our tax system and you know the the greenhouse gas emissions benefits are a happy accident so be it it still wouldn't apply to for example crown um, power producing assets so you'd lose probably 50 ish megatons of coverage just from uh, provincial exemptions. And then you might open the door to some gaming of that in terms of, for example, the um, oil and gas resources in the provinces and how you might uh, think about opening up a new constitutional can of worms on that front. And there are a number of constitutional cans of worms here, no question. <laughs> okay, I, I'm looking at the time and I'm just wondering if we, could if there is one more question to all of you, and I'm wondering if I if you are all okay uh, for me to okay. I see one thumbs up. I'm just going to ask it so that you can all uh, have one more opportunity to answer a question from the audience. So the question is: I have always understood Crown Zellerback to contemplate that matters that initially fell with within provincial jurisdiction could become matters falling within federal jurisdiction due to changes that occur over time. Do you understand the decision in the same way? And if so, do you think the GGPPA reference abandons this understanding? Certainly in my reading, at least Brown and Rowe do so. Maybe I read that too quickly. Eric, that seems like it's on your land there, but... Uh... Um, well, I, I think the questioner is right, that that's my read of Crown Zellerbach, and, and again, quoting from the Gibson article, as they extensively do in Crown Zellerbach, that's exactly the language they use, that matters can begin provincial and transform through some set of circumstances. It might be external, it might be time, it might be comprehension of what's happening that develops, again, not, not exclusive plenary jurisdiction, but the development of a federal aspect of that matter, which had been historically understood and which remained provincial, nonetheless, because of an external force, that thing has developed into also to contain a national aspect. And to the extent that that national aspect exists, federal jurisdiction may, may occur through the POG national concern branch. I think that's right. The other question was, does this new case abandon that understanding? Well, certainly Justices uh, Roe and, and Brown in dissent would have um, said that Crown Zellerbach wasn't of that, didn't hold that view. They said matters could never transform as I read their uh, opinions. Um, I don't think that's a fair characterization of Crown Zellerbach. Does the majority abandon that idea? I don't think so, but it's certainly not one that they spend much time um, discussing. If I may add um, to um, Eric's answer, I think if you look at paragraph 138, that's where the court actually, the majority recognizes this possibility through the example of atomic energy. And the court says that prior to the Second World War, um, you could see that the, the, the matter was clearly provincial through section 92, 5, 9, 10, and 13. But today there is clearly a federal aspect uh, and uh, that is recognized through uh, POG. And so the extraction of uranium and the uh, gener generally atomic energy fits precisely within that example of a matter that, you know, used to be only provincial and now has developed, uh, has like grown a federal aspect, if you want. Ever growing, ever changing. That's the constitution. Um, well, gee, you know, when you like constitutional law, it, it's really difficult to bring these di these events to an end. And unfortunately, we're, we're past time, so I'm going to have to do that. I just want to thank our panelists so, so much for sharing their knowledge, their expertise, their willingness to read this very, very long decision and to dissect it and talk about the, the aftermath, the, the impacts, the, the effects. 
that the, this decision is going to have. And, and clearly from what all of you have said, this is just the very, it's another beginning. There are so many more things that are going to morph uh, from, uh, from this decision. It's, it's, uh, it's a complex one. So I want to let you know that uh, we have um, we are going to be making a donation to the food bank, the Edmonton Food Bank, in your names, uh, as a way of thanking you. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Alina Ritzma, our public legal education coordinator, who's been monitoring the uh, audience questions, and also Zara Ahmed, who uh, who was very instrumental in organizing the uh, logistics around this webinar for their both their assistance. I'd like to thank the audience for your for your patience, for your questions, for your interest, and uh, and remind you please, when you receive the little reminder about the uh, survey to fill it out, if you would, please, we do really appreciate your feedback. And so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you all very, very much. And um, bon weekend. <laughs>